As socialist empty heads insist that the economy isn't working, a record high number of Americans are working because the economy is absolutely soaring. We will analyze the greatest jobs producer God ever created and the threats that it faces. Then, I know you'll be shocked to hear this, Jim Acosta is complaining some more. Owen Benjamin stops by, that huge pianist friend of ours, and Pope Francis changes church teaching on capital punishment. We will analyze the many uh, uh, wonderful benefits of uh, killing criminals. I'm Michael Knowles, and this is The Michael Knowles Show. That's a lot to get to in one day. We're going to have to do it, though. We're going to have to cover everything from how wonderful capitalism is to questioning certain changes that are coming out of the Roman Curia and out of the Vatican, certain things that seem a little strange. You know, there's a difference, by the way, when people, uh, a difference between Protestants or more evangelical Christians and Catholics is when more Protestant-leaning people question their pastors or question their their denominations teachings Th- they can be pretty vocal about it they can be pretty straight on and when catholics do it we say well is it perhaps the case that the holy father is mistaken is it, is it, I, I wonder if i am misunderstanding the holy father we will have to see if we are misunderstanding the holy father on the death penalty uh, before all that you know another promise has been kept President Trump, he promised us. Do you remember this? He's made a lot of promises. Everyone laughed at him. He said he's ridiculous. That'd be crazy. Everything was going to go terribly if he were elected. He promised us that if he were elected, he would be the greatest jobs president that God ever created. (laughs) And I remember when he said it, well, that's a really bold statement. Turns out that has absolutely been the case. President Trump, take it away. I'll be the greatest jobs president that God ever created. So there's a great spirit going on right now a spirit that many people have told me they've never seen before, ever. We're going to create jobs. I said that I will be the greatest jobs producer that God ever created. And I mean that. I really, I'm going to work very hard on that. All right. We're a year and a half in. Let's see. What does the record show? The record shows that in the month of July, the most recent month that we have numbers for, A record high number, 155,965,000 people were employed in the United States. That is an all-time record high. But by the way, that's the 11th record breaker since President Trump took office. Uh, This is true, by the way. Uh, The the way that Democrats and socialists try to spin this is they say, well, the economy is working really well for some people, but it's not working well for all people. And this is when they try to demagogue on issues of class division or race division or sexual division or whatever. But as even when you look at all of their divisive categories, the numbers still hold up. We have record low black unemployment. Uh, We now have record low Hispanic unemployment in the United States. This is the second record uh, because he's, he's had record low Hispanic unemployment two months in a row. Last month, the economy added 157,000 new jobs and unemployment has fallen below 3.9%. To put that into perspective, economists consider an unemployment rate of four to 6.4% to be full employment. Because if you're in a a system that has freedom, you're going to have some unemployment. People are going to be changing jobs. You might, you know, co- a, a company might fire somebody who's not doing a good job, and then they'll find a job that they're better at. So four to six point four percent is considered full employment. And we now have, we are now looking at an unemployment figure below that. We have more than full employment in this country, and uh, President Trump predicted it. He said that would happen. But why is that happening? Because he said, "I'm the greatest jobs president God ever created." That might be true. I mean, the, on the numbers, that is true. But then he said, I'm the greatest jobs producer that God ever created. And that isn't quite true. He's the greatest jobs president, but he's not the greatest jobs producer. The greatest jobs producer is capitalism. It's economic freedom. This is, a, and it's a wonderful time to be seeing these numbers because you have the rise of socialism across the United States. We've talked about how the Democratic Socialists of America have increased their membership eightfold in just two years. The majority of millennials consider themselves socialist. At the same time, we are seeing that economic freedom, economic liberty, capitalism creates jobs. It creates prosperity. This is the first time that we've seen this in our political lives as millennials. And it's impressive to see because why why is President Trump the greatest jobs president that God ever created? Because he is increasing freedom and decreasing regulation. He is letting people keep more of their money. 
by lowering taxes, historic tax reform on companies and on individuals. He's deregulating the federal government, so he's making it uh, harder for these bureaucrats and technocrats to control every aspect of our lives. He's uh, opening up uh, trade. He's negotiating better trade deals. He's trying to get better trade deals. We're, we're drilling, baby drilling. We're now the biggest exporter of oil in the world. Uh, we're, we're producing energy. Uh, you know, during the Obama administration, we would hear, no, you can't drill here. You can't transport oil or natural gas here. You can't do this. You can't do that. No, 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 no. And what President Trump did very simply, perhaps just on his gut, is when he got in, he said, we are going to unleash this economy. We're going to unshackle it. We're going to open up the bonds that are holding this economy back. And this thing is going to roar. And it is roaring. This economy should have been roaring years ago because you had that recession in 2007, 2008. And after steep recessions, you should have a, a steep recovery. But President Obama just put shackle upon shackle. So what did President Trump do? He opened that up. He unleashed it. Freedom works. Freedom works. So it's, it seems so simple. I think even conservatives need to tell ourselves this sometimes. Because sometimes we conservatives, you know, we get a little, a little contrarian, a little, uh, little tweedy, a little traditionalist. And we say, oh, I don't know about freedom. I don't, well, you know, pish posh. No, freedom works very simply. It works economically. We're seeing that with all of these numbers. It works politically. It works creatively. When you, when you unshackle people, they are free to be creative. They're free to do what they want. And this is true as a matter of political speech. The accusation against President Trump and this administration is that he's authoritarian. Oh, he's authoritarian. He's, he's a fascist. He's authoritarian. How is he an authoritarian? By letting people say and do whatever they want. You know, one of the observations of this era in politics is people are sort of frenzied. They're vocal. They're politically engaged. The federal government's not stopping them. The authoritarian so-called government isn't stopping anybody from doing that. You know, people are out there screaming. They're angry. They want impeachment. They want this. They want that. The president doesn't tell anybody to stop doing that. The, the, the freedom of the press has not been abridged. The freedom of the people to speak their minds has not been abridged. There, there is freedom out there. And by the way, even with all that screaming and all that fake news and all that anti-administration uh, rhetoric coming out of the mainstream media, the administration's approval ratings are 50%. They're doing very, very well because people, when you give them freedom, when they say, look, you can speak and you can speak and you can speak, battle it out. It gets really loud. It gets really raucous. It's not orderly. It's not quiet. It's not, it's not couth, but it's really raucous and people can get a semblance of the truth. This is a wonderful thing. Some people are not thrilled about this though. And by some people, I of course am referring to Ron Burgundy himself, Jim Acosta. Jim, take it away. I just wanted to follow up on, uh, on Sarah's question from NPR. She asked you about Ivanka Trump's statement that the press is not the enemy of the people. And she asked you whether or not the press is the enemy of the people. You read off a laundry list of your concerns about the press and, and things that you feel like are misreported, but you did not say that the press is not the enemy of the people. And I, I, I think it would be a good thing if you were to say right here, uh, at this briefing that the press, the people who are gathered in this room right now, uh, doing their jobs every day, asking questions of officials like the ones you brought forward earlier, are not the enemy of the people. I, I, I think we, we deserve that. I think the president has made his position known. I also think it's Richard, ironic. Telling us, I'm, I'm Sarah, trying to answer you your question. Okay, well, I, I politely waited and I even called on you despite the fact that you interrupted me while calling on your colleague. Well, you I said it's ironic. Which is why yes. I interrupted. I'm trying. But if you, if you finish, yes. if you would not mind letting me have a follow-up, that would be fine. But it's ironic. Jim, uh, that not only you and the media attack the president for his rhetoric uh, when they frequently lower the level of conversation in this country. Repeatedly, repeatedly, the media resorts to personal attacks without any content other than to incite anger. Uh, the media has attacked me personally on a number of occasions, including your own network, said I should be harassed as a life sentence, that I should be choked. ICE officials are not welcomed in their place of worship and personal information is shared on the internet. When I 
now is hosted by the Correspondents Association, of which almost all of you are members of. You brought a comedian up to attack my appearance and call me a traitor to my own gender. In fact, as I know, um, I'm the, as far as I know, I'm the first press secretary in the history of the United States that's required Secret Service protection. The media continues to ratchet up the verbal assault against the president and everyone in this administration. And certainly we have a role to play, but the media has a role to play for the discourse in this country as well. Preach, preach, Sarah. Yeah, baby. So Ron Burgundy, Jim Acosta leans in there and he says, listen, you, uh, we have freedom uh, of the, the press in this country. You need to respect the press. You need to respect the, the freedom of the press. And that's why you need to tell all the American citizens to shut up. Why won't you? Why won't you tell them to shut up? They're saying mean things about me, Sarah. Stop them. And Sarah Sanders is saying like, well, that sounds like a you problem, Jim Acosta. That certainly doesn't sound like a me problem. He says, no, say it, say it. And I, I love the idea of this, by the way, that Jim Acosta, you know, just a guy built in a lab for CNN. He's there. He's saying, hey, listen, lady, say what exactly what I want you to say. And she says, no, I'm not going to do it. And then the left is outraged because a woman wouldn't say what Jim Acosta told her to say. And she's exactly right, by the way. She has been pilloried. She has been attacked. The, uh, she's the first press secretary in history to require a secret service protection. And she says, no, we're not going to have that. We're going to let you, Jim. Look, first of all, it's incredible that they still call on Jim Acosta. I love that they do because I think every time Jim Acosta speaks, Trump's poll numbers go up 3%. But they, they call on Jim Acosta. They don't ban CNN. They don't censor CNN. And then what she's saying is not, not only do you get to speak, Jim, but your critics get to speak too. That's how this works. That how this, that's how this freedom is going to work. And, and to hear the media whine and moan, it's as though they've never been attacked before. They've never, no, this is unprecedented. No, no, no. Maybe Jim Acosta hasn't been attacked, but what about Fox News? Here's a clip from 10 years ago. I think it was 2008 of a mob swarming Fox News. Check it out. I'm sorry if that sounded like a fire alarm to you because they have to bleep out every every second and a half, every millisecond. They've got a beep, beep. Yeah, swarming them. You know, Che Guevara t-shirts on, uh, you know, saying no borders, no this, no that. And they're swarming. They're saying F Fox News, F Fox News. That's a lot worse than Jim Acosta's ever gotten. That's a lot worse. And you didn't really hear people complaining about it then, did you? But freedom works. Freedom works. And the left is really nervous about this. You've got, finally... Uh, this honest debate, we were talking about the honesty right now of the midterm elections. You have Democrats who are coming out and honestly saying, yeah, we're socialists. We want socialism. We don't like freedom. We want socialism. Then you've got a Republican, a conservative administration that's saying, have freedom, have it. We're going to unshackle the economy. You get economic freedom. We're going to unshackle political discourse. You're going to have political speech. You're going to have uh, freedom of speech. Duke it out. Do you want freedom or do you want slavery? That's the question that Owen Benjamin has dropped by the studio hey. to answer. Owen, what's up? You've been hiding quietly there since uh, since we've been doing that entire segment. I've just been sitting on a pun the whole time. <laughs> uh, Jim accosted. <laughs> so that's what I got. Am I right? Yeah. Owen Benjamin, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next. I, why didn't I have you write this, the title for yesterday's episode about Jim Acosta? Jim Acosta. I just thought right. of it now. Because when I'm told to be like, quiet for a bit, <laughs> I do a lot of really good thinking and puns. This is why you make the big bucks and I'm sitting here in a broom closet. Yeah, this is why I'm, 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 I look like a mime. <laughs> I like, just got off a plane and I'm like, I look like a mime. I'm here. I, that's what you were doing, sitting silently. Welcome. I, I, a, I'd be the, the verbal mime where I'm like, I'm in a box. <laughs> In case you don't realize it, this is a box. This sucks. Uh, I am a mime. Don't forget to tip me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look, it's a rope. It's not a chain. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're in town. Uh, are you just you just came here to mime and hang out? What are you doing in town? It's a good mime. You know, uh, well, it, pra- I was going to go to Prager's birthday party, and uh, I just did that Prager U vid. So I, I just stopped by uh, Corolla's place, and then you, and then just hanging out. That Prager U video was fantastic. For Thank those you. Those who haven't seen it, maybe we'll have to add in a video of this. It's you talking about the death of comedy. It's you yeah. talking about what's happened to comedy. And so you shot the video a while ago. Yeah. And then in the meantime, between you shooting the video and now, Netflix came out with the Nanette <laughs> anti-comedy 
comedy special. I want to do an anti-plumbing plumber. <laughs> where it's like, you know, I'm here to fix this pipe because human excrement is spraying everywhere, but I'm just, uh, I was raped once, so I'm going to go home and just you're going to drown. Like no, like, no other job that could even possibly be. It's unbelievable. You go up and you say, the, I am. Ex- I, thank you for paying money, everybody. I am explicitly going to do the opposite of my job. Right, and for those of you uh, thinking that I just brought up the rape thing to be a weirdo, that's what she said. Mm-hmm. So I was, like, mm-hmm. referencing what she was, like, trying to reference these horribly dark things and then why that's why she will not do comedy as she's being paid to do comedy. Well, I will say, you did have to clarify that because not a soul on earth has watched that comedy special. That no. anti-comedy comedy well, special. Well, except for their friends sending the trailer being like, what is this? Wow, wow. Yeah. yeah. That, you know, it's true. It would be like Jim Acosta getting on TV and spreading real news. You can't do that. That's not his job. No, his, his job, job is to, to be the news. irrational. He has to act like a schizophrenic donkey all the time. <laughs> Just hee-hawing and kicking and acting just ridiculous. It, so th- this topic that I've been thinking about all week is freedom works. Freedom I- is working. It's working politically. It's working economically. This ties into your video, right? This yeah. ties into like this oppressive, it, you can't, don't laugh, nothing's funny, don't, mm-mm, there's that culture. And then there's the culture of breathe the sweet air of freedom, have a laugh, have a chuckle. Yeah, it's about consent. You know, it's like, that's why it's so rapey on the left, you know? <laughs> Wait, how's it about consent? Uh, free markets. It's consent. It's like, mm. I want to work with you. You want to work with me. Let's make both of our lives better, that consensual relationship. And then you have socialism, which is uh, at the end of a gun. I will, I will establish the price of bread without any factors. Like, yeah. <laughs> there really is an element of force versus consent, and that seems to permeate people's entire lives. The left, I mean, we, we've seen this now. All these stories come out of these, like, the feminist good guys, the soy boy feminist guys. Yeah. They are by far the, cre- the creepy ones with girls. They, yeah. like, follow them around. And Harvey Weinstein, obviously, the Me Too movement. Maybe there's something to this theory. There, it's the coercion of the left. That makes them feel entitled to take whatever they want. Right, because what they're doing doesn't actually help women. In fact, it's horrifying. Where it's like, you know what being a woman is? Lots of abortions, you know, work 90-hour weeks, never get married, see you guys in 50 years. Like, that's, that's, that's as someone who actually loves a woman and, you know, we just had our second child. Yeah, and, congratulations. Oh, you just you. had a kid. The last thing I would do is establish a fake wage gap. She, she, she has her master's in engineering. My wife's a brilliant woman who wanted to stay home and be a mom and... And just push her into the salt mines of, mm-hmm. you know, and then just and, and say like abortions, empowerment and all this stuff. And then secretly they're just up to no good, these guys. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. That element of coercion. Where do you see it, though? I mean, because uh, I'm interested in it from a cultural perspective and a political perspective. So the midterm elections right now are being they're pretty honest. Do we want to keep Trump? Do we want to impeach Trump? Do yeah. we want freedom? Do we want socialism? You've got these socialist candidates. Where is it heading culturally? Are we going to get more nanettes? Are we going to get more anti-comedy? Anti- I think there's going to be a lot of division, but I think there's more conservatism happening with young people. But there is that millennial generation that just has all this dead and no purpose. And they really, the problem I see is that the, so, the, the evilness of socialism, that whisper like, I'll take care of your debt. Yeah. You know, they're like, Really? Because they're so like, they can't default on it. They were my parents are professors, and they warned me about this a long time ago. Where they're like, this is going bad, you know, the the devaluing of the of the 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 college education, where they're just letting in anybody, anyone can get a loan. Oh, yeah. There's you no can market graduate forces knowing on it. it. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. And my parents both uh, taught things like actual things, not this like <laughs> underwater lesbian ballet. They they didn't teach that. Oh, they're clearly well, they. My dad has his PhD on that. That's one of his PhDs. <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> No, but they're just giving people nonsense. They're actually, I, I read somewhere that if you study economics right now in college, you leave knowing less. <laughs> like for real, because your basic thoughts are, are better than this Marxist nonsense. Than what it's being replaced with, yeah. And it's weaponized empathy too, where it's like, I see the trick. I see like, don't you love poor people? It's yeah. like, but socialism isn't about supporting the poor. It's about destroying the rich. It's an envy-based evil ideology. And it's once you see it, you're like, uh, well, you you had that great video that came out, the last Bernie bro. Oh yeah. Where we'll have to put a link to it because it's like it's like a four minute video, right? It's a pretty long video. Yeah. And and the last Bernie bro, spoiler alert, is is living in Venezuela. He's yeah, like yeah. He's like on this mission. He's like I brought my you know my machete. He made sure he pronounced it the way that. that and then you know he's got bubbles, his frisbee, and two laquas in his vape pen. He's like I'm gonna go where the utopia is, and of course he goes to Venezuela. And my friend who's playing. 
the guard is not even looking that direction. It's only to keep <laughs> yeah, people yeah, in Venezuela. Yeah, right. And he's and he just, you know, spoiler alert, it's only four minutes long, but he steals my passport and I just <laughs> have to stay in Venezuela. Because yeah. it's this it's this extended childhood. There's no, you know, meritocracy is scary if you have no skills and you're raised with no values. Of course, and that's such an interesting point there in the video. Like, it tells you a lot about the country to go down to the border and see which way the guns are pointing. Oh, yeah. Which way are no, they No, because me and my buddy were talking about that. We're like, there is no socialist country in history where people are trying to sneak in, ever. Right, that's There's right. always rafts coming out of Cuba. Nobody in Miami is like, I'm going to float on a tire and get to Cuba. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. never, ever happened, so why would we want that? Like, North Korea, no one's running in. That's right. That's exactly all the Stan countries. No one's trying to go into... No, know, the Stan's are not no, good dudes. No, you know. Stan's... <laughs> Well, yeah, because so I'm he's actually track those guys down. I'm, Afghanistan, Pakistan, <laughs> dude. Know. Stanley, man, yeah. Stanley is not a good dude. I'm watching a, a, a Handmaid's Tale, and I thought I would hate it. I thought it was going to be anti-conservative uh, propaganda. It's, it's, it's about, great. dude. It's awesome. It's about <laughs> Islam, though. Like, I'm dead serious. I'm watching this thing, and I'm like, this is accurate Islam stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like even right. general mutilation is in it. Uh, covering the faces. Eight wives. It's it's literally like I'm watching this. I'm like, how is this spun to be anti-Christian? This By is- the way, when when uh, historians, when you're looking back to figure out when the moment was that we all started to get jihaded, it was this moment when Owen brought it up on the show. <laughs> yep. This was the beginning of of us at Daily Wire getting jihaded. So thank you very much. <laughs> hey, no I appreciate problem. that. You yeah. got to see my artwork of Muhammad and various horses. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, I, I don't, yeah, it's, 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 it's not. It is, I know, I actually, I agree with you. I, I've enjoyed watching Handmaid's Tale because it is just trash. I mean, it's a, like a trashy show. Yeah. But you look at it, the people on the left earnestly believe that that is where the United States under Donald Trump is headed. I, but I think it's like a psychosis because they don't see that they're almost accurately picturing socialism and some yep. of these caliphates and stuff. Like, it's not at all what the right wants. Of course. Like, it's all coercion. It's all, there's no f- free markets in the handmaid's tale. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, and, and that's that's the irony about this whole thing is well, they, you, they say what they're, you know, like clearly Hillary Clinton had something going on with Russia because this whole nonsense is coming from some weird projection. It's like the closet gay guy with like eight Z28s. <laughs> you know, it's like, dude, why don't you go camping with a dude? Gay guy, you were like, oh. what are you? What are you gay? You don't right, want to go right. and you're like, sleep with a man. What are you? I know. You're like, then you're like, what? Why are you going so far? And then the left, <laughs> everything they're like going so far with, you're like, mm. that's you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, you even see when Jim Acosta, when Ron Burgundy is yelling at Sarah Sanders, he's saying he, th- their premise is that the Trump administration is authoritarian, and all Jim Acosta is saying is, tell people not to do anything, tell people not to talk, tell people not to criticize me. She's like, we don't do that. That's right. what you. That's what you do. You you tell people to shut up. We don't tell. Of people course, to shut up. and the, of course, the irony is, if it really was what they described, they'd all be dead, and they would never <laughs> be able to say it. <laughs> right. <laughs> like the one way you know for a fact the media isn't actually being attacked in America, and this is not a fascist government, is because you can hear them talk about that. Right. <laughs> right. Cons- <laughs> incessantly. Oh, and it's this like comfort with cognitive dissonance. Like Trump is Hitler, give him your guns. Like yeah. all this stuff. You know, submit to tolerance. Like these things that a, <laughs> yeah. like any child could see. Their co- the comfort in it has to come from postmodernism where it's like mm. there is no truth in the world because if not, how do you function that way? Yeah. Like up, down. Like up is down, down is up. It just This is my question with the millennials and I honestly don't know which way it's going to go. The, the signs don't seem good. You know, more than half of millennials identify as socialist. They, they skew Democrat, all these things. But this is basically the first time in their lives, in their politically conscious lives, that they've seen prosperity. Yeah. They're seeing right they're seeing freedom. Their rhetoric sounds very pro freedom. Is there any way, do you think, that we can get them back or are they all just oh, going to yeah, be Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can totally get them back. You think? A lot of it is cultural too. I think a lot of young men don't have any strong male role models. That's mm. why they're drawn to people like you and Shapiro and Jordan Peterson and Cuz we're so masculine, you know. We're just so, we're so like uh, but it, Conan the Barbarian, don't yeah, you think? We're talking it uh, <laughs> before about how you were like the most manly guy at Yale so <laughs> Yeah, funny. that's right. Yeah. Well, it's only because like I I would wear Oxford shirts every so often. You know, I wasn't right. wearing a dress all day long. Right. That, you know, no, it's like, true. He's not wearing mascara. He must yeah. be a lumberjack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is, it's true. You think like, guys, I have never thrown a football in my life. That's I have so not, yeah. funny. That's right. But there is a sense of that in the culture. 
in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. We're yeah. do I'm doing a speech for Yaf in the fall, which is how to be a man when you look like a madow. And they're just very <laughs> simple things but, that you can do. But that's a very, that's a quality you just did that people want, whereas you can mock yourself. <laughs> yeah, right. You well, know? that's the other thing. They're so precious. These so, the, the millennials, they're so shocked when you, I don't know, when I interact with guys, I'm a jerk, you know? You yeah. kind of make fun of each other and... And you make fun of your own weaknesses or, or your own things that... Like, I it, I was I was laughing out loud when Shapiro was making fun of how he does ads. Yeah, yeah It's right. like, that's so male. That's so like normal male behavior where yeah. I would make fun of my size. Like, I'm an ogre, I'll, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, and 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 sometimes people don't get that, and they they want it so bad again because they're like that relieves our pressure. That's what mm -hmm. my PragerU video is about. That's right. Where it's like th this pressure is building, where no one can just mock each other, yeah. And then it it just explodes, and and I think that there is no mockery on the left. It's all because it's it's fundamentally such a lie that they can't ever be in their own skin anymore. They yeah. can't just be free and criticize each other. Like me and you could have an argument over policy and our friendship wouldn't be affected at all. In the least, that's yeah. exactly right, yeah. But for the left, when you attack their political opinions, they actually say this, they say, you're erasing me. You're erasing my identity. You're invalidating me, like a, you're really. It's like, sometimes I wanna be like, that dude's never seen a dead guy. <laughs> like yes, I'll show yeah, you an yeah, erased yeah. person. <laughs> it's horrifying. You know, it's kind of like, it's these people are almost doing live action role play with stuff they don't understand. You yes. know, one time someone was saying words are violence and I have two kids now. I don't want to go to jail or anything, but I want to just, <laughs> just, just, just go like this and be like, which one do you want? You want a word <laughs> yeah. or do you want me to seriously <laughs> knock your face off your body? Do you want to, do you want to see how words are not violence? And this yeah. is how I know that they don't have any sense of stakes. Cause I'm a giant and yeah. I'm, you know, there's no fear sometimes in these people. Yeah. You can, they're just like, you're the worst, you're white, you're a man, like words are violence. And I'm like, at no point in my life would I ever, that'd be like me looking at an eight foot man. Yeah, yeah. Like on a, like, like just I be, could eat you. I know, I, I literally would be you. like, do you need help? Do you want me to rub your feet? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, how do you not have that fear of just violence? And, yes. And cause I'm very anti-violence, but it's because, you know, I tell that to people, so I'm like, dude, don't forget Sermon on the Mount or you'll get Leviticus again. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like those are like that base is still there. That's right. Like we've expanded it yeah. to this freedom and the the lack Grace, of force. You know. Yeah, yeah but right. you can go right back to that if people start uh, forgetting about the work it took to get these freedoms. That's right. I remember in Exodus it says, "Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live." Perhaps you know we've got to go back to some of this more fundamental understanding. I don't know. That uh, that is so right. And the millennials, they're so afraid of. Um, or they're, they're so coddled, rather, that they, do, they don't have that sense of reality. You'll talk to them and you'll just think like, have you never rubbed up against reality for even one second? Never have once. You, no. They're atrophy. It's atrophy. It's like muscle atrophy. It's like when you have a cast and then your wrist looks weird. Yeah. It's like, um, and it, it's not like there's, I remember we're a uh, concept of like spoiled. It's not like they, they, they got everything taken from them with this. It's not yes. like there's no jealousy there because they now can't function. Mm-hmm. They like have no ability of like functioning in the world. And and I think it's, you know, a bad parenting. Well, it's I also, can't put it all on them. It's like their parents must, it's like Fight Club. It's like that absentee father, the absentee yeah. God that they're like, no one cared about me. They just sent me out and then someone's always watching me. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. And it, there is, like I've noticed this with people, people who have actually suffered in life, they go one of two ways. Either they like go to jail or they are the most joyful people on earth. Yeah. I had uh, that North Korean defector, Ji Sung Ho, came in here. Cool. This guy, I don't know that I'll ever meet someone who has suffered like I this guy I saw him has. as I was going into North Korea. Did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you? you know, that, where are you going? It's where utopia. Going, yeah, Socialist Democrats. Why would you want to leave? Why would you ever want to leave this utopia? <laughs> no, I saw him crawling out yeah. of the, as yeah. I was crawling in. Yeah, I was like, yeah. why are you leaving? What's going on, dude? Yeah, are you don't okay? you want freedom? Yeah. <laughs> don't you want, don't you want safety? Bread lines. Yeah, don't you? That's so, so what happened? So this, so I talked to him and I, and I noticed, I was thought like, this is the most joyful person I've ever met. So now whenever like, you know, I don't know, I stub my toe on my chair. I'll say, ah, man, my toe, you know. And my wife, she'll say like, oh yeah, should I call Ji Song Ho? Should I let him know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get a, a note, you know, like, and that-, that like, humans adjust. It, we, yeah, that's right, <laughs> come on, there's a stasis here. But the, when I see these uh, millennial types whining because like, they can't just be professional poets. They yeah. might have to like, get a job too. I just think like, man, me, you gotta talk to Ji Song Ho, man. You gotta I talk mean, to you've Ho. Never, yeah.
Because it's like, uh, the, yeah, the inability of feeling joy, that's the thing, is even if they did become a famous rapper or something, they still would never be happy. They'd yeah, just be course. crying on a yacht. Yeah. It's like, this yacht is dumb. This it's is like awful. the same nightmare is just on cheeks. flat. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> same nightmare sheets with a higher thread count. That's like, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is it. I mean, I just, like, looking around, this is why I'm very into owning the libs. I kind of, I disagree respectfully with our ambassador to the UN on this. Owning the libs, <laughs> is, it's great because it's, it's so attractive. It's, there's such a joy to it. There's an exuberance. Yeah. And, and you compare that joy to this relentless, tedious, self-serious leftism. How, how, why would you ever pick that? Got to own the libs. I'm not advocating killing the libs. Yeah, I want to just possess them. <laughs> That's what I always yeah. do with, uh, with uh, vegans. Like, I'm always like, I wouldn't eat a person. <laughs> You know, you just try to like go so far that they're like, what? Like, look, I'm a, look, I'm I'm like, a moderate. I have compassion. I'm a moderate. Yeah, yeah I would never eat a human being, I don't think. Yeah, mate, I mean, it's I don't like, know. I've never been it. to the Andes, but I don't yeah. know. We'll see what happens. Yeah, it's like, no, like, make it. I, I think leftism is such a destructive force that I, I don't know why people are like, saying that it's, I don't know. I'm like, no, you got to take it out any way you can. You get it just, out. Just get it. Because it's like, and be funny with it. I mean, if the best comedy they can do, if the comedy that the left has, which gets Netflix hour-long specials, is not comedy, then like, make them laugh, man. People just want to laugh. They want to smile. They want to have a little levity, it. you know? Yeah, I thought my career was done because of like certain opinions I had, and it's totally not. Opinions like we shouldn't castrate children? Literally. For instance, yeah. That, yeah. that opinion got you fired from uh, everything. Uh, right. Races all deserve jokes about them yes. equally. Oh, that's... Oh, there's nothing more condescending. Like, there'd be jokes yeah. I'd write with like a bunch of black dudes I'm on the road with, and some like... <laughs> Just white girl and like... Always a white girl. Always. Always a white girl. I and know. they're like, excuse me, excuse me. Excuse my am... neighbor's mailman's best friend is named Tyrone. <laughs> and you're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, it's so yeah. infuriating. Uh, Cory Booker's imaginary friend T-Bone would be very offended by that joke. Yeah, excuse they have me. like invisible black people all yes. around them. They're uh -huh. like, I got this one, T-Bone. <laughs> And you're like, D if you actually see human beings as individuals, yeah. you never know when the pothole's coming because mm -hmm. you don't see people as demographics. That's right. You know what your mistake is? I'm more into heightism. Like, I, if someone's under 6'5", I don't even look at them in the eye. <laughs> you can't. How no. Would you? <laughs> no, but I, honestly, I think, obviously I'm not a heightist, <laughs> but like, I think height is way more divisive than race as far as what your day is like. Totally. There actually is height privilege. That is true. There but are then you studies, go, Yeah, but then know? it goes farther. Like, I'm yeah. almost 6'8". Yeah, you're on the back end of that privilege. Yeah. I, I can't yeah. be on a roller coaster. No one in a nursing home is over 5'10". <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I'm the first one arrested. Yeah, you know, true. like, there's all kinds of stuff. You yeah, know, yeah, hip, I'm point. like a great Dane. Like, hips go out at, like, 40. Yeah. You, know, you know your mistake, though? When you, were, when you were making jokes about all the races, if you had only made jokes about white, white men and... Even if you just said really vicious things about white men, you could be on the New York Times. No, if I endorsed board. Hillary Clinton, I could just like rape someone. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. It's true. It's true. That Maybe literally to, is happening. I know. You, you might have had to donate. You might have had to donate a little too. Yeah. Harvey That's right. Weinstein yeah. was in like openly raping people, mm -hmm. and 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 they were calling him God. That's right. It's like what I just said seems so shocking, but people laugh. Good people yeah. just laugh yeah, because yeah. it's it's. There's so much truth in it that you're like, it is. that's true. You can get away with anything. Like I was at, like, and I think Louis C.K. is an incredible joke writer, but like, yeah. um, I'll watch some of his bits, and I'm like, the way he's talking about his wife and kids, I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, dude, you know, he's like, my something... my my daughter's. A, I don't even want to say it on your show out of respect, but yeah. I'm like, whoa, man. Yeah, I, I you know, can't. yeah, it and seems I, to I, be I, a little. Uh, well, that's that's like the James Gunn thing, right? You kind yeah. of say it's all jokes, and you think, well, maybe, but. There's some those are weird well, I disagree, jokes. I disagree with Shapiro, and now I think he actually might have been right because the dude yeah. is such an assassin. Like when you when you're <laughs> debating with him, you're like, whoa. Oh yeah, easy Paganini. He can sell spoiled milk to a cow. I mean, it is dude. Because I, yeah. I was I was convinced that he was wrong about it. Yeah. And and I I realized he's actually right about it because because <laughs> he was talking about if you know what you're getting into when you hire someone, you got to just eat that. That's true. Right. That, yeah. And so that makes sense because like. My point was like, no, we have to have standards. We can't go down yeah. that road of like, we're, we're becoming our enemies if we don't hire a known pedophile to babysit our kids. You know, it's like, no, there's right and wrong. And, and it's yeah. like, that's going to take a, a hit out of the business, the fact that he writes these things. Yes. But 
I mean, what he's saying isn't funny. And I know people have said that to me where they're like, your joke isn't funny. I'm like, because you don't understand hyperbole, irony, and assumptions. <laughs> yeah, right. but, yeah, because lefties are known for their great sense of humor. That's well, really what it's right. about. Right, and like, I'll, I'll even like describe what the joke is and how it's the opposite of what they think it is, and uh, they still don't get it. Of course. So I don't want to fall down that road and say James Gunn shouldn't do these jokes. Well, I don't personally think he should, but he should not be around kids professionally, is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I just love it. It couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. He was the first He's one to awful. cheer when they all got fired for jokes, and now it comes back and bites him. And and it is great because, you know, these guys are are dying by their own hypocrisy. You're, like, living in freedom. I mean, you're... Oh, it's awesome. Taken off. And, and, and it's like, you, you just have a happier life. Like... Mm-hmm. I, I would get those like lefty development deals that you don't deserve and all that stuff, but you don't enjoy <laughs> yeah. it. Again, it's almost like biblical. It's like you get yeah. all the world and you get nothing, you know? That's so true. So what uh, what are you up to? Where can people see you? Where can people find you? Well, my website is uh, hugepianist.com. I have three specials there, self-produced from the last year and a half. And yeah. then um, the PragerU video, watch it and share it. That's I desperately great. want to de- beat Dave Rubin because he gets a little <laughs> cocky about a 6.7 mil. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, and yeah, just YouTube. And Dennis's birthday party. Those yeah, are the places yeah. they can go. Hugepianist.com. Yeah. Uh, and where, so you figure uh, James Gunn has a Twitter, ISIS has a Twitter. Where can they find you on Twitter? Not on Twitter. Well, this is what I, I got kicked off Twitter permanently for an, uh, a, a joke that if I could say at a, at a Catholic preschool, not, not, not quite, <laughs> but literally nothing. And the more time goes on, the more people are like, this joke making fun of David Hogg? Yeah, well, you know, J- James Gunn gets to stay on, on Twitter, but you don't. I Dude, mean, that is like Farrakhan crazy. is on Twitter. Farrakhan, yeah. He, ISIS. like, hates Shapiro just <laughs> right. for his race. Yeah, that's true. Dude, the left yeah. is so racist. <laughs> and it's like, these guys are on there talking about how Jews are like a disease. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah. what? Yeah, but you're a huge pianist. They're not going to let you on. No, they're, but I'm a, out. I'm a quarter Jewish, so that kicks in hard. Oh, I'm wow. like, excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even find out I was Jewish until I was 20, but I always knew I was up to something. You are like, you are the Come tallest. on, that's a good bit. You are... <laughs> <laughs> like, I always knew I was up. To, I just think that's funny. It's a true story, too. I found out my grandmother was totally Jewish. I didn't even know. Is That, that is true. Yeah. You are, you are the tallest Jew since Samson. I, I'm almost certain I know. That's that. why I never cut my hair until that, recently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Louis Farrakhan is on Twitter. Like, that's insane. That That's true. It is insane. That's amazing. Like, and he's you, a genocide. Like, the way he talks about Jews is genocidal. <laughs> that's right. But yet, yeah, I'm not allowed it's to be like on a, there because I, I want my gun rights. That's right. That's right. That's terrible. That's uh, all right. Twitter's going to die anyway. Like Facebook and Twitter stocks are just plunging. That's why they hate the free market because nonsense is rewarded with a lack of money. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's absolutely right. And uh, well, so I'm going to see you tomorrow. Well, yeah, and I want see everyone to buy the leftist tears mug. You got to you got to uh, tumbler. You got to get it. The, the only way to get this, by the way, people, because I got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. I've given you too much today. I've uh, I've got to say goodbye. Go to but it says hot and cold. What about lukewarm tears? You can, you're not allowed to have it that way. Pick oh. a side. Stand in the middle of the road. Get hit by a truck. <laughs> Go to dailywire.com. Subscribe now. Get the leftist tears tumbler. We'll be right back. Unfortunately, without Owen. Owen, thanks for being here. Oh, dude, I had a blast. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who didn't catch that, I just said goodbye to Owen, and he stood up and cracked his head on our ceiling lights. <laughs> that is, Owen is on the other side of height privilege. He is not on the good side of height privilege. Man, it's always good to have him here. It's like a like the Tasmanian devil, like ten Tasmanian devils come through. It's, it's so funny, and he's like got such a fresh perspective. It's so good that he, this guy isn't being like just owned by studios. He's, he's on his own. I mean, fr- freedom works. Now, this brings us to our final point today. We're running a little late, so I'll try to cover it quickly. There's another side to freedom. When people abuse their freedom, when they use their freedom to break the laws, to hurt other people, to uh, violate the moral law, then we, we can kill them, and the state can kill them. They can. This has been true uh, at all times. It's acknowledged in the epistles. It's acknowledged in Christianity. It's always been the position of the Catholic Church, and today, Pope Francis has amended certain aspects of church teaching in the, in the catechism of the Catholic Church to say that the death penalty now is inadmissible. That's his word. The death penalty by civil governments is inadmissible. So we'll go into what that means a little bit and some of the thoughts on the health benefits of capital punishment, but lefty politicians are cheering. So fake Catholic politicians like 
the Cuomos, for instance. The Cuomos, Mario Cuomo, invented this whole, I oppose abortion, but I think it should be legal line. Well, I'm personally opposed to abortion, but I support abortion. And it, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. And it's, and it's absurd because abortion is intrinsically evil. Uh, so Andy Cuomo is running with this. Andy Cuomo, his son, the governor of New York, uh, tweets out today, quote, the death penalty is morally indefensible, has no place in the 21st century. Today, in solidarity with uh, Pontifex and in honor of my father, I will be advancing legislation to remove the death penalty from state law once and for all. This is the same guy, by the way, Andy Cuomo, who said that if you're not in favor of abortion, you're not a New Yorker. You have no place in New York. Uh, th- this is a, a radical lefty, and he's, uh, he quotes his church when it's convenient. So what is it with, uh, what is it with the death penalty? Is, is the death penalty morally acceptable? Well, uh, what, what Pope Francis wrote today is this. This is the new teaching of the Catholic Catechism. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is the book of teachings of the Catholic Church. Uh, there was a version that came out, I believe in 1992, is it, uh, from John Paul II. And uh, it formerly said that the death penalty in modern society, while not intrinsically evil, would be practically non-existent because we have other ways of dealing with criminals. It's now changed to recourse to the death penalty on the part of legitimate authority. Following a fair trial was long considered an appropriate response to the gravity of certain crimes and an acceptable, albeit extreme, means of safeguarding the common good. Today, however, there is an increasing awareness that the dignity of the person is not lost even after the commission of very serious crimes. In addition, a new understanding has emerged of the significance of penal sanctions imposed by the state. Lastly, more effective systems have been developed. Uh, Consequently, the church teaches in light of the gospel that, quote, the death penalty is inadmissible because it is an attack on the inviolability and dignity of the person. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I don't know. So inadmissible, what does inadmissible mean? What is it really saying? You know, because the the Pope is not allowed to change doctrine. That, That doesn't happen. People mistake this frequently because of people don't understand papal infallibility. The the Pope can't change doctrine of the church. He can articulate doctrine. He can clarify doctrine. So inadmissible, that's not the same as saying it's intrinsically evil. Inadmissible means uh, not capable of being admitted or conceded or allowed scope for or conceded as valid. Okay. Tricky wording, isn't it? Um, Was it always inadmissible? No, it certainly wasn't always inadmissible. Uh, St. Augustine writes about this. He says, the same divine authority that forbids the killing of a human being establishes certain exceptions, as when God authorizes killing by a general law or when he gives an explicit commission to an individual for a period of time. Uh, Thomas Aquinas says the same thing. It is permissible to kill a criminal if this is necessary for the welfare of the whole community. Uh, Now look, Pope Benedict, this isn't a total break with Pope Francis. Pope Benedict said, quote, there may be legitimate diversity of opinion among Catholics about waging war and applying the death penalty. So there can be some disagreement. It doesn't mean that now if you're pro-death penalty, you are not Catholic or something like that. Certainly not. But I would like to bring in a little bit of history before we go here on, on the death penalty and the church and the health benefits of capital punishment. In Rome, In 1817, Pope Pius VII was reigning. Three robbers were beheaded. They were beheaded for robbery. Between 1814 and 1870, 369 criminals were beheaded in the papal states under the control of the Pope. He, uh, you know, got to take care of those criminals. Giovanni Battista Bugatti, who was the official papal executioner, used an axe to chop off criminals' heads before the guillotine was brought in to be more humane. Uh, The Pope, between 1814 and 1817, just three years, sanctioned the hanging, drawing, and quartering of criminals 11 separate times. Heinous crimes, particularly heinous crimes, uh, were not treated in this way. Instead, those criminals had their heads crushed with the mozzatello mallet. That's a little stronger. That doesn't seem to be quite in keeping with the modern teaching. Agatino Bellomo, uh, who was the last to be executed in the Papal States, asked Blessed Pius IX for a stay of execution. Blessed Pius IX responded to him, this is the last person executed there, and said, I cannot and I do not want to. And then he was executed. Uh, the, The issue here is that capital punishment protects human rights. It protects human beings, human life, and uh, the natural right, so, uh, the natural uh, law, rather. So there, there are different kinds of punishment. There is uh, retributive punishment, punishment just for justice's sake. There is uh, deterrent punishment. So when 
when people are punished harshly for a crime, it discourages others from doing that. Uh, there is uh, therapeutic punishment. You know, you can put someone into a rehabilitation center. You say, oh, you know, the purpose of putting someone in prison is to rehabilitate them. Okay, that's, that's one of them too. And, and there is uh, medicinal punishment, medicinal capital punishment, which is that the Samuel Johnson quote, when a man knows to be hanged in a, that he's going to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. When you know that you're going to be killed for your crime, it uh, clarifies the world a little bit. It, it, if the, the whole point of the Catholic teaching on capital punishment, excuse me, is that we want to bring people to Christ. We want to give them a time to repent. Well, when you're looking at that guillotine over there, it focuses your mind. It really brings certain questions to mind. Uh, a, a more modern example of this, because you can talk about all the papal states and popes chopping off people's heads and, and all that is very good. But consider the Nuremberg trials. Uh, during the Nuremberg trials of all the Nazi war criminals who slaughtered and genocided whole scores of people, uh, Pope Pius XII was so eager for justice that he sent his Jesuit archivist to assist the prosecutors at the Nuremberg trials. Pope Pius XII personally told the prosecutor, Robert Jackson, quote, not only do we approve of the trial, but we desire that the guilty be punished as quickly as possible. One of the defining features of this pontificate is some confusion. There seems to be a lot of confusion on matters of divorce, matters of who can receive the communion, matters of capital punishment, matters of church teaching, evolution, where, where things are going. I mean the evolution of the church, not uh, monkeys turning into people. Um, there, there seems to be a lot of confusion and it, it would be nice to have some clarity uh, because the church has had moral clarity on this issue for a very long time. And the, if the confusion persists and, and suggests that capital punishment is intrinsic evil, then uh, first of all, church tradition will be changed. Our, our doc, <laughs> uh, the thoughts of the church will be changed. But uh, it, it's really morally unclear because uh, there's nothing Christian about letting the wicked rape the face of the earth, letting the cruel rape the face of the earth. There's nothing Christian about that. And uh, let's hope that that confusion doesn't persist any longer. I told you at the top of the show, when, when Catholics have trouble with things that are coming out of the Vatican, you, you know, you're like very, very respectful about it. There was a group of, uh, of clergy who formally accused Pope Francis of heresy. But the way that you do it in the Catholic Church is you, it's called a... Uh, a filial letter of correction for heresy. And <laughs> like, most holy father, we, we think we may have misunderstood what you were saying, you know, very, very respectful. So let's hope respectfully we can get some clarity on all of those matters and people don't forget the important medicinal effects of hanging and having your head chopped off. In the meantime, <laughs> we, you know, we started recording Another Kingdom. Another Kingdom's coming up. Get ready for, you've got to binge that first season so you're ready for season two. It is really, really cool. I will tell you that. In the meantime, I'll see you soon. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you Monday. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Senia Villarreal. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer, Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Jim Nickel. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.